Each day of creation begins mysteriously at night. And there was evening and there was morning. This phrase is repeated six times in the creation account. And on this evening, God begins to create vegetation, plants, created by the word of God, without rain, without dew, and without the direct rays of sunlight, for the sun was not to be created for another 24 hours. The entire plant kingdom sprouted up and flourished in a single day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. Plants are the most obvious form of life on Earth. Plants are the first living things astronauts see when they return to Earth, the green leaves of tall forest trees. 100% of everything we eat comes from plants, two-thirds by directly eating plants and a third by eating animals that eat plants. The section of biology that deals with plants is called botany, taken from the Greek word meaning plant. Typically, plants are green, and they make their own food using sunlight. Plus, they have a tough fibrous cell wall that makes them rigid and gives them that crunch. This is a trachea. A trachea is a tube-like structure used to bring air in and out of the lungs. And you thought this section was on plants? It is, because modern botany just happens to divide the plant kingdom into two main divisions, plants with a trachea and plants without a trachea. The actual primary division name for the plant kingdom is tracheophyta, which means plants with a trachea or a windpipe. Because when you cross-section these plants, the microscope reveals thousands of trachea-like tubes that carry water and food to the plant. Just like your trachea carries air in and out of your lungs, tracheophyta. Now, botanists never actually refer to plants as having tracheas. Tracheophyta is simply the division name. What they say is that plants have vascular tissue, because the word vascular means a slender tube, just like the trachea tube in your throat. Our word vase, or vase, is related, because as you can see, a vase is also a slender tube, just like vascular tissue. The other main plant division, which we'll talk about later, is a collection of oddball plants. Things like algae, moss, mold, mildew, all non-vascular plants. No trachea tubes to absorb water. They absorb water through their surfaces. While all vegetation was created on the third day, Genesis chapter 1 specifically mentions herbs and fruit trees, all vascular plants. Things that you encounter every day. Fruit, vegetables, trees, shrubs, grasses of all kind, they're classified as angiosperms because hidden inside the fruit of every one are seeds. And that's what angiosperm means, hidden seeds. Nine out of ten plants have their seeds hidden inside the fruit. Most plants are made up of four basic parts, the flower, the leaf, the roots, and the stem. Technically, a flower is not a plant. It is part of the plant. Flowers are visually pleasing and aromatic, but flowers have one primary function. They reproduce the plant. They make seeds. Plant flowers vary greatly, but they all work something like this. The crown of a flower is formed by the petals and these supporting leaves. Inside the petals is often a central stalk, topped with a stigma and surrounded by the stamens. The stigma is considered a female part of the flower, since the flower's eggs are located in the base. The stamen is considered the male part of the plant, since it carries the pollen to fertilize the egg. You can remember the difference between the male stamen and the female stigma, because stamen ends in the word men, 
and stigma ends in the word ma. Often there are several male stamen that surround the single female stigma. Some plants are male only or female only and must grow in the same vicinity in order to reproduce. Other plants can self-pollinate directly from stamen to stigma, but cross-pollination from nearby plants makes for a strong and healthy plant population. Pollen is produced on top of the stamen here. Wind scatters the pollen. So do hungry insects and birds who want the sweet nectar cleverly located deep inside the flower. The pollen rubs on the insect or the bird, and as they are visiting neighboring flowers, the pollen they carry rubs off, and some of it will land on top of the stigma. The pollen will begin to grow a long tube, reaching all the way down to the awaiting egg. These fertilized eggs become new seeds. The pod surrounding the seed begins to grow to protect it, and that surrounding pod is what we call fruit. We tend to think of fruit as juicy, sweet produce. But to a botanist, the ripening base around the seed of any plant is the fruit of that plant. This includes acorns, beans, cucumbers, grains of wheat, the base of any flower, and yes, apples and oranges. These are all the fruit of a plant. The fruit protects the inside seeds. Now, vegetable is a generic term that we use and it means the edible part of just about any plant. We eat the roots of plants. We eat the stems of plants, that's what celery is. And we eat leaves of plants. And of course, we also eat the fruit of plants. Of all the fruit in the world, what do you think is the most produced fruit? The tomato, that's right. The tomato is the fruit part of the tomato plant and is the most produced fruit in the world, 60 million tons a year. The second most produced fruit, bananas, 44 million tons. Some fruit protects only a single seed, often called a stone, but others protect multiple seeds. Every one of these blueberries contains over 100 seeds, count them. Seeds reproduce the plant, but some plants can spread without seeds. A cutting of some plants will sprout roots and form new plants. Grafting works this way also. Graft a lemon tree stem, for example, to an orange tree, and the lemons will grow much faster than starting from seed. Iris roots, called rhizomes, are extremely efficient in spreading new iris flowers. Growing a plant from a piece of a stem, a root, or a leaf is called vegetative reproduction. But most plants spread by seeds. Using the wind, using water, animals spread seeds. They eat the fruit and undigested seeds scatter in their droppings. And they hide acorns and nut seeds. Seeds catch on their fur. People are also known for spreading seeds. Spores are a special kind of seed. In fact, spore means seed, and ferns are the prime example of a spore plant. No flower, no fruit, but under the leaves, called fronds, are these tiny spores. These little dots are actually clumps of millions of spores. When the spores ripen, they blow away from the parent plant and start to grow on their own. A single microscopic spore will produce its own male and female cells and fertilize itself and produce a whole new fern. But most plants have flowers with fruit and seeds, and regardless of their variety, shape, and size, flowers have one primary purpose. They reproduce the plant. Everyone likes a sweet from time to time. Plants like sweets all the time. In fact, that's just about all a plant will eat, sugar in the form of glucose. Now, you may remember from your childhood days that dirt just isn't very sweet. So 
If plants are in the dirt, where's the sugar coming from? Like this place, they manufacture it. Every leaf is a miniature sugar factory. Leaves come in any one of a thousand different shapes and varieties. Most leaves are broad and flat and have two main parts, the blade and a little stalk attaching the blade to the branch. You can think of the stalk as the plant's foot because botanists do. They call the stalk the petiole, which is Latin for little foot. On the blade, there is usually a main rib and a network of veins. Pine needles contain a resin which give them their distinctly pleasant smell. Leaves eat sunlight, but some leaves eat meat. They are designed to trap and digest bugs. Sundews have sticky droplets on their leaves to trap unsuspecting insects. The pitcher plant attracts insects who come for a drink, but instead fall into a pool of water and digestive juice where they drown and are digested. The Venus flytrap grows in swampy areas of North and South Carolina. When tiny hairs inside the trap are moved by a bug, the hinged doors slowly close and trap it. The bug eventually dies and the plant digests it. While only a few plants can eat bugs, all leaves were designed with chlorophyll, an amazing chemical that allows plants to make their own food using sunlight. We call the process photosynthesis. The chlorophyll is inside every cell of the leaf. Chlorophyll itself is green, which is why plants are green. They're full of chlorophyll. In fact, chlorophyll literally means green leaf. Here's how it works. Plant leaves take in carbon dioxide from the air and water from their roots. Using sunlight for energy, chlorophyll takes apart the water and carbon dioxide and reunites them into sugar. A few scraps of oxygen are always left over, which the plant dumps into the air, pure oxygen, and we breathe it. People breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen. And plants also store sugar by converting it into starch. Things like potatoes and carrots and beets and radishes are examples of plant food storage. As the days get cooler, photosynthesis is less productive. This signals the plant to prepare for winter. A barrier forms at the base of the petiole, cutting the leaf off from the rest of the tree. As the green chlorophyll fades, new colors emerge, yellows, bright reds, oranges, blues, and purples, colors always present in the leaf, but masked by the abundant green chlorophyll. Eventually, the leaf falls off. This mark is called a leaf scar where the leaf was once attached. Food production is over for the year. No leaves, no new food, because leaves have one primary function. They make food for the plant. This is the stem of a plant. And this is the stem of a plant. The stem supports the plant and forms the plant's link between the air and light above the ground to the water and minerals below the ground. Tall, upright plants with a woody stem are called trees. Plants with several low woody stems branched near the ground are called shrubs and bushes. Plants with long thin stems growing on the ground or entwined around other supports are called vines. Grapes are a woody vine. Cucumbers are an herb vine. Stems also transport water and minerals through the vascular tissue up from the roots. Look at the stems on the mint family plant. Square.
Roots anchor a plant to the soil and they absorb water and minerals for plant growth. Tap roots are a single, long-reaching structure like dandelions and carrots. Fibrous roots form a tangling mass of thin, hair-like threads. The tangling mass holds on to the ground, absorbing water and helping the soil from washing away. All grass has fibrous roots. We are so familiar with grass, we hardly even think of it as a plant. But grass affects you more than you probably know. It's true on the one hand, we don't eat turf grass, but on the other hand, Wheat, oats, barley, corn, rye are all grasses. Grind the grains and bake them, and you feed the world. Ferment them, and you get beer, whiskey, vodka, bourbon, rum, grass products. So controversial, they were once outlawed by an amendment to our Constitution. And grass products so strongly desired, they were legalized by another amendment to our Constitution. A somewhat less controversial grass is sugarcane, a perennial grass. Boiling cane produces steam, forming these sweet little crystals, sugar. The average American eats more than 150 pounds of these little crystals every year. Columbus discovered a grass never before seen by any European, Asian, or African. He called it Indian grain and brought it back to Spain. Today, 350 million tons of Columbus's Indian grain are produced every year. We call this particular grass corn. Animals feed on a whole range of different grass called forage. One acre of forage grass can produce about 400 pounds of market beef in a year. Humanity depends on an uninterrupted harvest of grass. Should the global harvest of grain grass fail for even one season, the resulting famine could potentially depopulate the world. When full, this wheat silo holds over 5,000 tons of grass grain. Rice is another type of grass grain, and rice alone feeds over one half of the entire world's population. Grass binds the soil from erosion, and it beautifies our homes and our parks. Grass makes paper, soap, glue, cloth, dye, string, perfume, cardboard, wallboard, plastic, varnish, virtually everything we have is in some way manufactured by some part of grass. Some plants have a very short lifespan. As the weather gets warmer, they flower, produce seeds, and die all in a single year. These plants are called annuals, a word which means one year. The advantage of having annuals is that they generally bloom all summer long. There are other plants that have a much shorter blooming cycle, but they come back year after year. These plants are called perennials. In the spring, warmth increases and perennials start to wake up and sprout buds. A bud is simply a baby flower. The petals are tightly packed inside the bud and slowly emerge, opening into a mature flower. Once pollinated, the fruit develops and the seeds get distributed. The mother plant continues on year after year. They are 
permanently perennial. Trees are an example of perennials. They can live for hundreds, even thousands of years. The oldest living things on Earth are trees. Bristlecone pines growing in the White Mountains in California are 4,500 years old. That means the seed from those trees were planted right after the flood. They grew when the pyramids were being built and when Abraham left his home in Ur. Trees are also flowering plants with hidden seeds, angiosperms. But look at the seeds in this cone. They're not protected by fruit. Trees with exposed seeds are called gymnosperms, meaning exposed seeds. Pine and spruce trees are major examples. Sperm means seed. Gymno is Greek for wearing no clothes from which we get the word gymnasium, which might give us a little insight into ancient Greek culture. The majority of gymnosperms are cone-bearing, or conifer. Almost three-quarter of the Earth's land is covered with trees, and they are not only the oldest, but also the largest living things on the planet. Coastal redwoods are over 350 feet tall. The base of some sequoias are as wide as city streets. Trees either lose their leaves in the winter or remain leafy throughout the year. Woody plants, like trees, that lose their leaves and remain leafless throughout the winter are called deciduous. Deciduous means to fall off. Oak and apple trees are examples of deciduous trees, and rose bushes are deciduous also. Woody plants that drop their leaves gradually and retain full leaf coverage throughout the year are called evergreens. Ivy plants are considered evergreens. So are all conifers like pine trees, because pine needles are considered to be leaves. As the seasons change, most trees produce a new layer of wood every year. By counting these annual rings, you can tell how old the tree is. Foresters often take core samples of trees to count these rings. Eight years old. Same age as I am. Now we come to the non-vascular plants and the plants that aren't really plants, maybe. They include things like algae, moss, fungi, liverworts, mold, and other apparent undesirables. But are they really plants? Botanists still debate over where to put many of these organisms. We will start with moss and liverworts. 
They made it into the plant kingdom because they use photosynthesis for food. Moss is this soft green carpeting that covers old logs, rocks, and roofs. Liverworts are similar to moss and are small, low-growing plants filled with moisture and green with chlorophyll. Wart, incidentally, is Old English meaning plant, and a liverwort is a plant shaped a bit like a liver. Algae is otherwise and rudely known as scum. The slippery film on rocks that makes you go, ooh, scum, that's algae. The word algae even means moldy and putrid and is in no way related to the word algebra, just in case you were wondering. Much of algae is scummy, but some algae is of real benefit to mankind. Oceans cover two-thirds of the planet, and algae are the dominant plants of the oceans and of most rivers and lakes. Algae are the first foods which the smallest fish eat, providing food again for the larger fish. Without algae, there would be no ocean life. Algae are the primary producers of photosynthesis on the Earth. Billions of tons of food and oxygen are produced every year by algae. Algae are organisms with photosynthesis, thus they are plants. But without roots, stems, leaves, seeds, or flowers, so maybe not plants. Maybe they are animals, since many of them move voluntarily with little whipping tails. But so many of them reproduce by spores, maybe they're not animals after all. You see the problem with classifying them? As a group, they are far more like plants than they are like animals, and biologists often refer to them as plants when no one else is looking. For our purposes, as a group, they can remain in the plant kingdom. Algae can reproduce very rapidly. It's called algae blooms. You've probably heard of red tide. Well, that's the algae called dinoflagellates. They're growing so rapidly that they discolor and poison the water. Algae growth can block irrigation systems, pumps, and filters. Some can cause skin irritations, even death. That's the bad side. On the other hand, many algae are beneficial, if not tasty. You've probably eaten lots of algae and don't even know it. Ice cream, chocolate milk, salad dressing, pudding, mayonnaise, toothpaste, all get thick using an emulsifier, kelp, which is a brown algae. Seaweed is also an algae, and 10% of the Japanese diet is seaweed, like the seaweed found in this specialized bar. The tens of thousands of different algae are usually classified by their color. Green, yellow, red, brown, and blue-green algae. As I said, they are difficult to classify, and they are currently scattered throughout three of the current kingdoms. Mm. Diatoms are a microscopic algae with a hard glass-like cell wall. When they die, their outer walls settle to the bottom of the water and pile up. These are the White Cliffs of Dover, England, 20 miles wide and 300 feet high, made entirely of piled up chalk and diatomaceous earth, probably piled up during the worldwide flood. In 1866, the chemist Alfred Nobel was experimenting with the highly explosive and unstable nitroglycerin. After several factory disasters, including one that claimed the life of his brother, Nobel stabilized the nitroglycerin by combining it with, that's right, diatoms, diatomaceous earth, yellow algae. And by doing so, he invented dynamite. Not quite as explosive, but definitely in the nasty category are fungi, sometimes called fungi. The very word has unpleasant connotations, fungi. Fungus largely feeds off of dead and decaying material, or worse, living organisms like us. This is one of the reasons they got kicked out of the plant kingdom. 
no photosynthesis. The categories include things like puffballs, stink horns, mold, rusts, smuts, athlete's foot and ringworm, all fungi. In 1850, potato fungus in Ireland destroyed five years of crops, leaving nearly one million dead. Another million people left Ireland for England and America in order to escape the Great Hunger. The fuzz on bread and the old spaghetti in your refrigerator, fungi. And fungi can grow at the astonishing rate of one half mile per day. Yet, there are a few good eggs in the basket. Blue cheese dressing, yeast for bread, mushrooms, all fungi. But be choosy about your mushrooms. One out of a hundred mushroom species will be poisonous. Which one of these is deadly? Choose wisely. What about penicillin? It's the most widely used, and some say overused, antibiotic in the world. It could save your life if it came down to it. Made from fungus. Fungus will often team up with algae. Together we call this unlikely duo lichen. You see it growing on the sides of trees and branches nearly everywhere. The algae feeds the fungus, and the fungus shelters and waters the algae. Some lichen, such as Icelandic moss, can be eaten when food supply is scarce. George Washington's troops boiled lichen to thicken their soups. So why am I telling you this while reading a book on Peter Rabbit? Well, it just so happens that Writing adventures about Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail was not the only interest of Beatrix Potter, the author of Peter Rabbit. In the late 1890s, Beatrix Potter also worked as a scientific illustrator. She was fascinated by natural science and mushrooms, fungi in particular. She became convinced that lichen was not one plant, but in fact, two plants working together, and it is. She wrote a paper detailing her theories in 1897, which later helped to verify the true nature of lichen. You see, you can't judge a book by its cover, and you can't always judge an author just because she writes stories about mischievous bunnies. So much of our lives revolve around plants, we hardly give it a second thought. Everything we eat comes from plants. Everything we breathe comes from plants. The most soothing color on the human nervous system has proven to be green, the color of plants. Everything that makes our lives livable in one way or another comes from plants. Plants were our first food. Interestingly, it appears that for the first 2,000 years of history, that people were probably vegetarian until after the flood, and after that, they were permitted to eat meat. In fact, they were required to eat meat to keep the Passover. God must have a special place in his heart for plants. He made so many of them, and he often compares them to spiritual truths. The righteous are wheat gathered into his house. The wicked are weeds gathered for the fire. A good wife is a fruitful vine, and children are olive plants around a good man's table. Greed and worry are the thorns and thistles that choke out the truth from people's lives. Jesus himself was a single grain of wheat that fell to the ground and produced a great harvest of grain. And in the new heavens and the new earth, the tree of life will again flourish, bearing new fruit each month, and the leaves will heal the nations. Plants are the providential proof of how gracious and wise God is with us. Plants nourish us, sustain us, provide for us, give us pleasure, and bring us spiritual truths. God made it good, and in this goodness, He brings to a close His day's work on this, the evening and morning of the third day. <laughs>